have a soul? Yes. What is it? Uh, um, it's the thing that is me that is in there. I don't know. And what's it made of? Uh, energy and stuff. Guts and black stuff. <laughs> like energy <laughs> is that? What is that? I don't know. It's a different. It's a different thing than anything else is in the world. Is it a physical thing in the world? Is it a part of the world, or is it not the world? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I think it's both. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's a. a existential thing that we can't understand and a physical thing okay that we can't measure <laughs> that we can't measure yeah huh. yet maybe we could someday but okay so it's a big complicated question right yes or like once you dig into it it starts to get really messy yeah so this was a question that a self-educated woman 400 years ago not only dared to ask, but she answered it boldly and thoroughly. She explained everything about it. And in fact, not just the soul, but the whole and entire universe. She came up with the answer, the solution to life, the universe, and everything. What? And it wasn't 42? No, it wasn't. It took her quite a few more numbers than that. Uh, <laughs> to explain it. But she provided her own bold answer 400 years ago when women weren't supposed to be having ideas about anything like that at all. Wow, that's good for her. Yeah. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Her name's Margaret Cavendish, and she was born in 1632 in England. Huh. She was a lady-in-waiting to the Queen of England. She was paralyzingly shy. She had famously super eccentric fashion taste. She wrote books in which she dared to explain the universe itself. She wrote the very first science fiction novel. What? And all of this in, in the 1640s? All of this in the mid-1600s, yes. Why do I not know this? I know. She was a, a scientist, what we would call a scientist, before the term science existed. So we're going to call her a natural philosopher. That's what she called herself. Okay. 400 years ago, we might have pronounced her name Candish instead of Cavendish. Ah. But nowadays everybody says Cavendish, so that's what we're going to go with. All right. I interviewed Dr. Rachel Robison Green. She is a philosopher. My name is Dr. Rachel Robison Green. Um, I have a PhD in philosophy. I focus specifically on metaethics and ethics, and I publish on that regularly. But I also have a strong side interest in um, women in early modern philosophy. Dr. Robison Green is currently working on her 12th philosophy book. Wow. Um, but she came across Margaret Cavendish a while ago in a pretty interesting way. Well, um, I went, I got my PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and one of the faculty members was uh, Eileen O'Neill. Um, sadly, Eileen had been battling cancer for most of her life and just passed away um, at the end of last year. And Eileen was responsible for reviving an interest in women in the early modern period, if we can say that there was ever much interest at all in, in uh, <laughs> g giving birth to an interest in women in early modern philosophy. Um, so Eileen went to Princeton, and at Princeton, one of the uh, qualifying requirements for the PhD program was to take an exam about a philosopher. And the idea here was that you needed to know uh, the complete body of work of a philosopher. Uh, to, to be able to exp uh, express a competence in that. But uh, what was strange about the test was that it was called the great man exam. Um, <laughs> and so Eileen balked at that and 
she said, well, why is it called the great man exam? Shouldn't it be the great person or the great philosopher? And the response of the department chair was, well, who do you have in mind? Do you know any women uh, <laughs> in the history of philosophy? And so Eileen then dedicated her life to uncovering the great works of women throughout the history of philosophy. Wow. So now, thanks to Professor O'Neill, we know about this female philosopher from 400 years ago. How cool. But before we get into her really interesting ideas about the universe, we have to talk about her life because it's a crazy story. So she's born in 1623 to a wealthy-ish family. Um, She's a woman, so they're not really going to give her a thorough education, but, you know, she knows how to read. She -hmm. knows how to play all the musical instruments. She knows how to sew. She knows all the womanly kind of things. Right. But she was a serious bookworm, and she considered herself a writer even at a very early age. She just loved to write things down. Hmm. And she said it's because people discouraged women from talking about their thoughts <laughs> and so she wrote them down instead ah. she could write down as many ideas as she wanted right and nobody would give her trouble for that she became a lady in waiting to the queen of england the queen of england at the time was henrietta maria she was married to charles the first Okay. And if, you, if you've heard of the English Civil War, then you might know what's going to happen to Charles I later. I was going to say Charles I who, who loses his head. That Charles I. Yes. All right. <laughs> so she's a lady in waiting to the queen. And that's a pretty special role. You know, that's a hard job to get. Um, and it was kind of her first foray out into the real world. She goes off to the royal court. Everything's going to be amazing. She's going to eat the best food and wear the coolest clothes and talk with the greatest people. But as soon as she actually joined the royal court, she hated it. <laughs> and she wrote back home to her mom saying, please let me come home. Please let me come home. I hate everything here. <laughs> and it was because she discovered she was paralyzingly shy. Hmm. super bashful she just couldn't deal with people and everything that was going on at court and she hated it but her mom wouldn't let her come home (laughs) her mom was like this is the greatest opportunity you're ever going to have in your life you're connected with the richest most influential most powerful people in the country you're not coming home so she was stuck there (laughs) right also you know for i'm sure family family honor too right they're not gonna let her dump this chance that's a big deal for them exactly i think they were really hoping that she would marry well she needs to Mm. find a very rich and powerful man and make the whole family more rich and powerful right so her parents are saying opportunities abound at the royal courts that this is as good as it's ever going to get things could happen there for you that will determine the course of the rest of your life so you must stay so she stayed And sure enough, big stuff happened (laughs) that affected her and everyone else's life, probably in ways that they weren't quite expecting. Right. (laughs) A civil war. Yeah. Which was aimed at the deposition of the king and queen. They captured the king and... They cut off his head! They cut off his head. The queen, she had to run for it. And Margaret Cavendish, as lady-in-waiting to the queen, she had to go with her. So now not only is she still stuck in the royal court she doesn't like, she's also in France with no promise of ever being able to go home ever again. Oh, man. (laughs) Thanks, Mom. Yeah. But meanwhile, back home, her parents, they were on the wrong side of the Civil War. They sided with the royalists, with the king. So as uh, things went south for the royalist cause... They lost land. They lost their wealth. You know, the, their world was basically just crumbling down around them. Jeez, that must have been so scary. Yeah, especially if you're just like this young girl away from home for the first time. And she's abroad. She's in exile. She's paralyzed by her shyness. Her parents' lives are in <laughs> shambles. 
And she responds with, it's the philosophical life for me. I'm going to start <laughs> thinking deep thoughts about the mysteries of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe she's one of those people who kind of takes solace in the life of the mind or something. Yeah. You know, you can escape from whatever's happening around you and yeah, exactly. live in your head. It's a path nearly untrodden by women. It's certainly mm. not a place where women belong. This wasn't a popular time for women to be writing about philosophy. Um, right. In fact, most of the figures, most of the other women that were writing about philosophy at the time were doing things like trying to justify why it was acceptable for women to read in their spare time or trying <laughs> to justify um, why it would be appropriate for women to write. The general line of thought at the time was that women shouldn't read because it would invite it incite their imagination too much right that they would they, they would be blown away into fits of fancy um, the cartesian philosopher malbranche thought that one of the reasons that women shouldn't be educated is that the fibers of their brains were just so much smaller than the fibers of men's brains that they were easily swept away into imagination and emotion and this can lead to like dangerous behavior man it never ends. <laughs> Every century, there's a new explanation. So people like Anna Maria von Sherman and others who were contemporaries of Cavendish were writing about why women should be educated and so on. It's, it's not going to lead us into sin. I don't know why they thought that educating women would push them into sin, but they did. Uh, whereas Cavendish, by contrast, is writing about some pretty hefty traditional issues um, that all sorts of people throughout the duration of the history of thought were working on. Let me read you a passage, though, in her introduction. Okay. So, um, because she's definitely tackling this idea that people might think she's crazy for writing. So she says, It is probable, some will say, that my writing is a disease. But what disease they will judge it to be, I cannot tell. I do verily believe that they will take it to be a disease of the brain. But surely they cannot call it a lethargical disease, perhaps they will say it is an extravagant or at least a fantastical disease, but I hope they will call it rather a disease of wit. Let them give it what name it please, yet of this I am sure, that if much writing be a disease, then the best philosophers, both moral and natural, as also the best divines, lawyers, physicians, poets, historians, orators, mathematicians, chemists, and many more have been grievously sick. So <laughs> she's making, she's contending that, well, if I'm sick for writing, then so is everybody else who's ever written. While she was in exile, she met and eventually married a fellow exile, William Cavendish, who maybe some people have heard of. He's like the ultimate cavalier. He is the courtier. He's like, like, mm. think three musketeers, that kind oh, of Oh, yeah. Thing. He's that. Her romance with her husband, William Cavendish, he was 30 years her senior, um, was basically a, a literary romance. They wrote to one another. Uh, they were both passionate about poetry and ran in intellectual circles. He likes her shyness. He's charmed by her quirkiness. And hmm. he seems to be genuinely smitten with her intellect. Here is a woman hmm. who's interested in things nobody else is interested in. And yeah. she loves reading and she loves the world of ideas. This is the woman for me. So <laughs> they got married. <laughs> but their future seemed pretty grim because William Cavendish had been basically almost like a second father or a godfather to Charles the I's yeah. son, Charles the Second, William Cavendish had basically raised Charles the Second. He was in charge of his entire mm. education. Charles the Second lived with him. William Cavendish was as tight as you can get with the royal family. So since they were mm. in exile, you know, they were going to be in exile forever. Their their life yeah. was going to be a shadow of its former self. 
But then, back home in England, the way that the Civil <laughs> War panned out, um, after the royals were ousted, some pretty extreme Protestants eventually ran the country. <laughs> And the guy who ran it all was <laughs> Cromwell. Yes, Oliver Cromwell. He takes over and he gets extreme too. He He's so enthusiastic about returning <laughs> England to its former greatness and its moral rectitude. But he swung the pendulum too far the other way too. The Puritan <laughs> government did things like ban dancing and sports, yeah. colorful clothing, Christmas. And so eventually people were like, you know what? This really isn't working for us either. Cromwell died of natural causes, uh, probably kidney stones or infection oh. as a result of kidney stones. Oh. And his son took over, but his son just didn't have the kind of charisma. He had no support. Mm. And it actually opened the way for Parliament to change their minds and... <laughs> send a message to France. Hey, royal family, would you like to come back? We'll take you back now. Sorry about the whole head chopping off thing. Just kidding. <laughs> you can come back now. <laughs> so Charles II, who had effectively been raised by William Cavendish, right. he goes back and he's the new king of England and they restore the monarchy. They call it the restoration period. And suddenly their fates are completely changed. The monarchy's back and with it, the Cavendishes, they have money, they have wealth, they have power. And to uh, acknowledge what an important role they played in his life, Charles II gave them all kinds of land. He gave them titles. They were named the Duke and Duchess of Newcastle. So they had lots of money, lots of property, lots of everything. Hmm. And I've actually been to one of their castles that they owned. Ooh. Um, Bolsover Castle in Derbyshire in England. It's very impressive. It's really cool. It's unlike other castles in its kind of eccentricity, hmm. which is exactly reflective of who they were. They had lots of grand parties. They loved literature and the theater. They loved architecture. They also were very successful in the military and hunting. <laughs> Their castle, Bolsover Castle, has a famous music room too because they were really, really interested in music and the, the shape of it, the architecture, the ceiling, it's all really stunning. And that's mm. why I went there in the first place because I was researching musicians in the early modern era. Right, yeah. It's really quite an amazing place. So I'm I'm going to put a link to a BBC documentary about the castle and the Cavendishes on our website. So oh, if cool. people want to, you know, kind of digitally visit the castle, they yeah, can. Because cool. it's really an amazing space. Buildings, I think, can tell vivid stories about the past, about a lost world or lost peoples. Mm. And if this building can tell us about Margaret and William Cavendish... It tells us that they were quirky and eccentric and a bit strange. Cavendish does natural philosophy, which anymore we would probably call science, except for she wasn't really employing scientific <laughs> methods. Um, uh, but she's the kinds of questions that she's trying to understand are questions about causation or the way the world is, works fundamentally, what the smallest units are and things like that. So questions that scientists would consider now. She wrote 21 books. Wow. And they really ran the gamut of all kinds of genres, what we would call today genres, but they didn't really exist back then. She was just writing everything that she was thinking of in every kind of way. But she didn't just stick to fanciful subjects like women were supposed to. Mm. You know, women are allowed to write poetry and dreamy stories. But she wrote about broad, sweeping, big questions of the universe and how it works. Wow. You know, what does it all mean? How do we explain how it works? And she was the only woman doing hmm. that. Yeah, what's interesting, too, is that it was custom at the time that if women were writing, they published anonymously. Right. And she famously was like, no, <laughs> my, my works are going to have my name on them. Early on when she was writing... 
uh, philosophy. She wrote it as poetry. She did that because she thinks poetry is a more forgiving form of writing. So philosophy requires a tremendous amount of precision. And she, so she started out writing poetry and then became more and more and more precise. And you see her work as she ages and develops as a philosopher, looking a lot more like the philosophy of her contemporaries. So she's saying something so bold. Uh, it's kind of bold now, still in the 21st century. And hmm. certainly back then, 400 years ago, it was a bold thing that she was saying. First of all, she was a thoroughgoing materialist. This was super unusual for a person at her at time, right? So whereas Descartes embraced something like a mind-body dualism, mm -hmm. um, where mind is distinct from body and can exist independently from body, what Cavendish embraced was a view called panpsychism, where um, she believed that... Um, there was a rationality that permeated the universe. But it would be incorrect to think of this rationality as being like something like the entire universe has a soul, because after all, she is a materialist, so she's going to deny this distinction between okay. uh, physical and non-physical being. Yeah. What she advocated was this view of complete immersion or complete blending, um, where the physical world was mixed every level with a rationality. So every, all of physical substance has, uh, it has, you can, you can say that it has two natures, but that those natures are indistinguishable in substance. Okay. Um, that it's, that the entire universe is material, but it has a rational and a non-rational part. She's saying you are a physical being. There are no magical or invisible or immaterial parts of you. None of that exists. Everything can be explained in terms of cause and effect, physical phenomena. Everything is physical. Wow. And to me, this seems like a strikingly modern stance. You know, this is yeah. what modern scientists say. But for a woman to be saying that 400 years ago, just after thinking really hard about it and being like, yeah. you know what, here's the solution. Wow. It's a surprisingly bold stance that we call materialism today. Yeah. This may seem strange to the modern ear, but one of the reasons why she would advocate this kind of a view is that she's rejecting the views both of Aristotelianism and this new view of um, mechanism. So mechanism, mechanistic philosophy uh, is... Um, the, uh, the listener here might be familiar with the, the philosophical view of determinism, which is this idea that all events have causes and that substance and motion can explain, if you know enough about the way the natural world works, why things happen the way they do, why events take place the way that they do. Mm -hmm. So this is mechanistic philosophy, essentially. Okay. And it's a view about causation. Uh, and then, of course, Aristotle's got his own views about causation, which are maybe too complicated to go into here. She's rejecting both of those ideas. So her view about causation has to do with this rationality of um, the universe. So an example that Dr. O'Neill gives in the introduction and that Cavendish mentions in her work um, has to do with, we can think about a hand and, uh, throwing a ball. Okay. Okay. So on, on Cavendish's view, when the hand throws the ball, it's not that um, the hand is causing the ball to go up. It's that the hand provides an occasion for the ball to go up. And that there's this sort of sympathy or understanding between the hand and the ball that accounts for the causation. Because everything's intelligent, okay. and there's a, there's a kind of sympathy between everything in the universe that uh -huh. can explain how they can cause one another. Okay. Like how events can be okay. caused and change can come about. It's a, it's a strange view. And she goes even one step further than just saying everything is physical, that there is no magical, invisible, immaterial substance out there. Um, she tries to explain where human rationality and intelligence comes from and mm. how it all works. If we have an idea, it feels like an idea doesn't exist physically, you know? It's just, right. it's just an invisible thing. It's a thought, and thoughts don't exist physically. Mm. But she said, yes, they do. Those are physical things. All rationality, all thoughts, all ideas, all feelings, all of that, it's all physical. Wow. 
But she goes even one step further because she says it's not just humans who have rationality, who have intelligence. Everything has intelligence. Everything mm. has rationality flowing through it. Every like, every living thing or everything? N- everything. Everything. Wow. The chair that you're sitting in, everything you see, you know, the desk that's in front of you, everything, rocks, dirt, wow. everything has rationality flowing through it. Oh, so that again, is, she's, that's totally Taoist. <laughs> yeah, she starts to seem really mystical again. Like, yeah. this is kind of in the realm of energy, you know, just everything yeah. has energy. But she says, no, it's not energy in the way that people who use the word energy mean it. Right. She says, no, this is all cause and effect physical phenomenon like dominoes. And they all hmm. influence each other and they're connected with each other. And that's how everything happens in the world. And that's how that's the origin of all of our thoughts. That's the origin of everything on Earth. Maybe you could think of it like this. Although this is this is speaking very loosely. We ourselves, let's, for a second, let's just put aside the idea that there's a soul. Okay. Um, we ourselves are physical beings mm-hmm. comprised of material substance and are conscious at the same time. Okay. Right? So, so what, what you could say about us is that our, our physical stuff is conscious, right? It has the property of being conscious. Mm-hmm. It, that's not, that's part of the physical stuff. It's not distinct from it. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so you could apply that to Cavendish only that would be true of everything. Right. So mm-hmm. if, if you think uh, the, the analogy maybe comes apart if you think consciousness comes exclusively from the brain. Yeah. But if, ana- if consciousness was in every particle of your being, uh-huh. inter- like irreducibly interspersed with every bit of your being, huh. uh, then that's maybe what she would think about the universe as a whole. So this music is, probably sounds pretty strange to the modern ear. Although I can think of some some recent like novels and stuff that have similar sorts of ideas. So the His Dark Materials books, uh, child, like their young adult yeah. books, yeah. Uh, they yeah. advocate, yeah, they advocate something like a uh, universal consciousness in a way. And you know, because of the nature of her views, um, Cavendish was an early advocate of kindness toward animals. And I don't want to exactly go so far as to say animal rights, but that's something more progressive, something more forward-looking. By contrast, Descartes, or a contemporary of hers, Descartes was of the opinion that animals were mere automatons, right? Mm-hmm. And that they, well, if they displayed emotions, it was it was illusory. We're, that's something that we're bringing to the table. Huh. Where Cav- in, in light of this view that rationality permeates the universe, um, we're obligated to care about the interests of animals. It's radical for the time because you can see the implications that this might have for religion and so there are some serious obstacles or barriers to, or at least questions to answer here. The view of causation obviously leaves questions open for how the role that God plays in all of this. I mean, I would seem that would be like a dangerous stance. I mean, religiously. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. In a time period when you gotta be Christian how do you reconcile those two perspectives? Yeah. She seemed to not have a problem with it. She actually had to defend um, whether her view would be fundamentally, ultimately consistent with a religious worldview. Because she's, she has a view that is very different from the natural philosophy of people who try to defend uh, Christian the existence of a Christian God. So there was some pushback there to the extent that people were responding to her stuff at all. <laughs> Radical, right? Well, and, you know, now they can scan your brain and say, yeah, your thoughts are physical things and we can watch them move around your brain and we can move them around for therapy. Exactly. Yeah. And here's what's so wonderful about that. We have these modern tools to look at our brain and go, oh, my gosh, she was right. She's totally right. We can see how the thoughts are just zapping along the neural pathways. But in her day, she totally poo-pooed 
scientific measuring tools and you know she she saw people <laughs> who were trying to measure things or using telescopes to look out into the sky she was like oh, pointless what are you tinkering with these tools <laughs> they won't tell you the secrets of the universe <laughs> wow so i i asked dr robison green what would she make of us today and that was one of the points she made that that she would be shocked that our tools turned out to actually be useful and, if anything, to even further her ideas, prove that she was right, and yeah. go even beyond them and say, look, we can see the universe now. We can, we can understand everything yeah. out there. One of the other ways she was surprisingly right was that she said the universe is infinite. It doesn't have any end. It just keeps going forever. Uh, whereas anybody else who was talking, who had even talked about the universe since ancient Roman times, had said it's a, it's a limited thing. It's like a globe. And it, yeah, and it's then surrounded by a void. And the void yeah. was a really big deal to earlier philosophers. But she said, no, there's no void. The, inf the universe goes on forever and ever, which hmm. again seems to be confirmed by our modern tools yeah. as far as we can tell. So cool. Wow. So she wrote all these books. She had all these bold and really brilliant ideas. But, surprise, surprise, people didn't take her seriously. I'm shocked by that. <laughs> they called her crazy. Mm -hmm. They gave her the nickname Mad Madge. <laughs> and they basically just brushed off everything she said as, you know, isn't it amusing that she's trying to have ideas about things? It doesn't seem like her views were um, rejected or not widely discussed because of their content. It sure right. seems like it's because people thought it was silly for her to be dipping her toes in these waters to begin with. Yeah, and, and a more harsh criticism came from Henry Moore um, in response to her philosophical letters. He confided to another um, female philosopher, Anne Conway, that Cavendish, quote, may be secure from anyone giving her the trouble of a reply. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, sh the, the, the philosophy that she provides here is, is tremendously, it's, it's tremendous just as a wor work of philosophy. And it's also it's remarkable in historical context because she's talking about things that other women were not talking about, not publishing on. And yet, I think for in many ways, because she was a woman, people were rejecting it as unworthy of a reply. Maybe it was because she was eccentric. Hmm. She famously dressed pretty wild. <laughs> she really, she liked costumes. She would have, she had these wild outfits. Um, I feel like if she lived today, she definitely would be like a radical Comic-Con type. She would be, oh. <laughs> she would, she'd be so into cosplay. Yeah. And she was really open about just loving that, that she wanted to dress way different from everybody else. Wow. And to me, that's, that's a really interesting thing to lay alongside her her super shyness. That's what I was you just going to say. She's yeah. drawing attention to herself. Yeah, exactly. And you'd think a bashful person would be like, don't look at me. I'm not interesting. Maybe that works. Maybe if you wear weird stuff, people don't talk to you. Let's try it. Let's try it this week. <laughs> Let's wear the wildest things we can think of. I live in Boulder. I can wear anything I want and literally nobody will care. <laughs> But if it is just her eccentric dress and her eccentric nature and her eccentric house and all that, something doesn't quite make sense because her husband was pretty eccentric too hmm. and they didn't brush him off. Yeah. So No, it's because she's a girl. Yeah, it's more likely it's because she was a woman and she was firmly in men's territory yeah. writing about natural philosophy and the, right. the secrets of the universe and things like that. Right. If she was writing saints' lives or something, then that might be respectable. Exactly. She probably would have been celebrated yeah. if she had done that. Even though the ideas being expressed, they were unique to her, but they weren't 
they, they certainly had a place in the general dialectic, the general discussion of these concepts. They? And they weren't so, they, they sound pretty radical to us today, but they, they weren't so radical in that context, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Because we, we didn't have the kind of scientific advancements that we have today. And so uh, the way the world fundamentally works was more uh, subject to speculation. And so her, this, this, the things that she were specu was speculating on weren't fundamentally more wacky than, than some of her contemporaries. Huh. So what do you think would have happened if it was Descartes who had published these ideas? Uh, I'm sure it would have wide readership. The cool thing is, her husband believed in her. He supported her, he helped her, he cheered her on, and he even wrote some pretty wonderfully beautiful supportive statements about how she was going to go down in history as the greatest mind there ever was. He, wow. he seemed to really, really believe in her, and he was behind her all the way. How cool. It sure seems like he was tremendously supportive of this. And, and like I said, uh, their romance was one of letters and uh, intellectual pursuits. And so um, her husband wrote this. To Her Grace, the Duchess of Newcastle, on her observations upon experimental philosophy. This book is book of books and only fits great searching brain and quintessence of wits. For this will give you an eternal fame and last to all posterity your name. You conquer death in a perpetual life and make me famous too in such a wife. She hoped and maybe even planned to be eternally famous. <laughs> and I just love that her husband was on her team. You know, he was so supportive of that. Wow. Uh, their tomb is in Westminster Abbey. She died at age 50. And her husband wrote the inscription on her tomb, and I just love what it says. This duchess was a wise, witty, and learned lady, which her many books do well testify. Uh, it does come up again and again, this uh, desire for fame, and a desire not for fame in terms of great beauty or wealth, um, but fame for uh, intellectual accomplishment and creative pursuit. And now she's on a podcast about women that you've never heard of. How sad she would be sorry. so depressed about it. Sorry, <laughs> Margaret Cavendish. I'm so sorry. We're trying. <laughs> We're trying. She's tremendously important as part of the history of ideas. How did we, you know, before we entered a technological revolution, how were we thinking about these kinds of things? And that can tell us, the way that we were trying to answer these questions can tell us something about the human experience. There's what it is to be human, how, where we naturally go to explain the most important phenomena in our lives. What we're after when we study figures like this, it's, it's not just a, you know, philosophy can be a search for truth, but I think also it's important that we're understanding the history of, of the humanities. We're understanding the history of human thought and where we went and what kinds of ideas people had and, and that kind of trajectory. If that's the case, then uh, so, sometimes the stories that get told, I mean, if you just take a high school history class, you might conclude that women never were thinking deeply about these issues much at all. And so if you're trying to understand the history of human ideas, studying somebody like Cavendish, whether she's right or wrong, disproves that idea. There have been lots of women thinking about big philosophical ideas throughout the history of time. We just had to wait until we could catch up to her. Yeah, they didn't understand her. We needed to get society ready for her brilliance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's such a cool character. Yeah, I love her. I'm so mad that I've never heard of her. How have I never heard of this woman? One thing that is a, a, a common human endeavor, a common human question, just trying to understand the nature of the world, right? Trying to understand the at its very fundamentals, right? at the very at base, bedrock, what is this world that we're, we're living in? What, what is this universe that we live in? And so she was daring enough to try to answer that question in the 17th century as a woman. And I think that that highlights that that's a fundamental human question, right? We, we desire to know what the universe is and what our place is in it. And she's noteworthy for, for taking a stab at that question. 
If you want to learn more about Margaret Cavendish, we have links to digital collections of her works on our website, as well as books in our bookshop, including those written by Dr. Rachel Robison Green, which have titles like The Princess Bride in Philosophy, Twin Peaks in Philosophy. And you can also follow What's Her Name podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Music for this episode was provided by Mark Nelson. You can get free downloads of that music on our website and Solus Camerata, directed by Kira Zeman Rugen. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. This episode was edited by me, Katie Nelson, and What's Her Name is produced by Katie Nelson and Olivia Mickle. What's Her Name podcast is brought to you by donations from listeners like you. Thank you. <laughs>